good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are located on the planet, because this is the beauty of the internet. We don't know where you are, in which bubble you live, in which planet maybe you're located. This is another episode of todebate.net. Oh, that's kind of the invented jingle, uh, the new jingle. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. I'm just tired. And uh, no, I'm not so tired because this is another debate. So I have full, tons of energy to debate against my friend and colleague and debater. Derek, how are you today? I have a pretty good idea on what planet most of our listeners are located. At least according to uh, our analytics framework, most of them seem to be on planet Earth so far. It's going to be interesting in the, in, the dec in the centuries to come when you'll have a new version of analytics. And you'll have, you have to have one superset, which is which planet you're on. <laughs> <laughs> this will happen, right? It will happen. Not if uh, Elon Musk listens to our first debates and decides that indeed going to Mars was a stupid idea to start with. Uh, fair enough. Although, I'll say two things. First of all, with um, Elon Musk's latest tweets, I'm not sure he's <laughs> going to achieve anything. Uh, and the second observation, which is more serious, is that, I mean, we, we, the planet is not going to wait for us, right? Earth. Like, we, we're destroying it. We have to leave. Like, <laughs> there's not going to be much Earth left, so we have to find some other home that will gladly, you know, not know any human beings, have never seen one, and does not realize how destructive we can be. So, I think it's inevitable. Now that we are on that positive note, I have to ask, what what does your filter bubble look like from the inside, Sebastian? I'm scared. <laughs> are you trying to blame any kind of filter bubble I may have? Because I can guarantee you they're nothing new. Like, we all live in kind of filter bubble. <laughs> I have to stop here because I'm already infringing on the time I have. Today's motion is stop blaming filter bubbles. They're nothing new. But before we do that, uh, before we get into the debate, Doug, can you give us a very brief definition of what is a filter bubble? Yeah, a filter bubble is a concept that came up in recent decades when people realized that our search engines and the tools that we use to retrieve information is governed by algorithms. So tools like Facebook, Google search, what have you, try to guess what are the most relevant and interesting results for us. And the way they guess that is through signals we feed them, like the kind of things we liked in the past, the kind of people we follow, the kind of articles those people seem to like. Through that observation, people realized that your results in a given search engine result or in a given social network and my results may differ significantly. And they are filtered through our existing networks and our existing predispositions. And that is the very definition of a filter bubble. Since our own action filter down what we see of the world and seem to reinforce what we perceive as information of the world, we kind of emphasize ourselves and our own beliefs to the point that we don't see contradicting information anymore. And the thing is, there's a tendency nowadays to, to blame those filter bubbles or to increasingly point the finger at either technology or the concept as if it were something new. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. And this is what we're going to debate today. And the flip of the coin decided that I would defend the motion, which is stop blaming filter bubbles. They're nothing new. And you'll be against that motion and you'll actually get started also with your two, mi two minutes of arguments. So whenever you're ready, you can do this. Let's do this. Okay, let's do this. Dirk goes first and argues against the motion. Now, we already defined what a filter bubble is. So basically, what we didn't say is what it results in. It results in a world in which your information is purely selected based on your own preferences, on your own biases, and maybe by extension, filtered based on the biases of the people closest to you. So why is that a new thing? It is a new thing because we never, until a couple of decades ago, lived in a world where things have been individualized. So in the past, out of pure necessity, things have been produced, information has been produced for larger groups of people. Even if you, if you bought the most niche newspaper tailored to a specific political direction, it still was meant to target thousands of people at once. 
Today you get your handcrafted, sometimes down to the headline, customized piece of information based on you and you only. And that is new. That has never been the case. Why is it a problem? First, people form movements based on even the most irrational beliefs these days. Pizzagate is an example of this because people feel that information is confirmed by numbers of others that seem to feel the same way, that they take that as a social proof. And then they take things for granted and assume things as true that are in fact not. And they act on that. And those movements can, can be dangerous. Another reason why that is a problem is that people stop learning about facts that may contradict their existing worldview. There's no need for that anymore. If your favorite search engine gives you all the stuff that you want to hear or the stuff that you disregard is completely out of left field, then you are comfortable in your bubble. You, you don't have to expose yourself to things that are slightly off and so you don't learn about opposing worldviews. And thirdly, filter bubbles are also an effective way to manipulate people. So governments, uh, non-governmental organizations, political parties, religions, what have you, may use that to manipulate you and to change public opinion. So yes, filter bubbles are to blame for a lot of things these days, and they are indeed a new phenomenon. Next up, Sebastian. Let's hear his argument. Filter bubbles are nothing new because we have always filtered the information that we want to have. The kind of news we want to read, the people we want to hang out with. And the only difference maybe today is indeed what you've mentioned, although I'll get back to this uh, later on, is maybe the, the, sp the speed at which, at which this news or these fake news or these filters can spread is potentially much faster and can reach more people. So potentially could be more dangerous. But the concept of filter bubbles is nothing new here. We're talking about a scale and the threshold would be very difficult to define. Indeed, social media search engines add another level of filtering uh, beyond the previous filtering of people or clubs or news newspapers that we, we choose and chose in the, in the past. But in essence, filter bubbles are nothing new. What we can blame though if we want, is the use of technology and how that technology is being used, which is a different concept from the concept of filter bubble. I'll give you an example. WhatsApp uh, has allowed the spread of violence in India by spreading fake rumors and fake gossip. Now, this is nothing new. People have always had and used fake gossip to uh, exert violence, but the use of this technology here has emphasized this uh, even more. So the concept of violence has always existed. But the use of a technology has increased the impact it may have had. So you can't really blame the, the violence that exists in each of us in this case. right? This is the way technology has allowed this to spread even more. And even if we did not choose the information we read, media has always had something called an editorial board, for instance, which by definition, editorial board edits and chooses which articles to publish. So newspapers which have been around for more than a century have already spread these filter bubbles that we enjoy being indeed comfortable within. And, and finally, and I'll get to, to more details afterwards, most of this filter bubble is the result of user choice. You tend to go to the stuff that you like, that you want to read. Uh, it doesn't matter what algorithm is there, you're going to go to the news information that feels comfortable for you regardless, just like you chose a newspaper, which is the one that you felt most comfortable with in terms of opinions. So no, there's no point in blaming filter bubbles. They're nothing new, and the problem is not there. And now on to Dirk. Let's hear his rebuttal. Yes, newspapers always had an editorial board. But that comes right down to what I said earlier. It's a difference if the editorial board, uh, board optimizes the, the front page for you and you only, or for thousands of people. Most people don't realize when they surf to the front page in the internet of their favorite newspaper, whatever that may be, that this front page alone looks different, whether you're Sebastian or Dirk or somebody else uh, with maybe completely contrarian views. So that is new. No editorial board in the past did that, that service for you. And it's even one step ahead of that. It's fully automized. It's automatically generated for you based on what you interacted with in the past. 
Now, this is significantly different. I, I grew up in a time where I had four TV stations to pick from. And yes, there was the more conservative, the more progressive, and maybe the two special interest channels. And if you go to pay TV, you could add three or four more to that. That's a different world that we live in today, where you have literally your self-selected, algorithmically optimized program just for you. And that leads me to another thing that you said that I think is quite important. You said filter bubbles are created by user choice. And I firmly disagree with that. I beg to differ. I give you an example. My favorite social network used to be, until recently, Twitter. What I liked about Twitter was that uh, whenever I select the group of people I followed, I got their unfiltered, chronologically sorted stream of common thoughts, articles, recommendations. Some of which I agreed with, some of which I didn't, some of which I found mildly irritating, some of which were very interesting and enlightening. Now, Twitter changed this, and I, I assume that not everybody was actually aware of that change. Twitter changed to an algorithmic timeline. So instead of showing you things in a chronological order, you see tweets now based on what Twitter believes captures your attention longer on the platform. Now, I ask you, why is that? Answer is easy. Because Twitter wants to show you ads, and that is what the money brings. So they optimize for presenting ads to you. The longer you stay on the stream, the better it is. And that is not you selecting what you want to see. It's not you picking what you're interested in. It's basically Twitter trying to optimize for that. Now, what will turn you into a user that scrolls longer over the timeline? Either something that com is completely down what you prefer. So the things that you completely agree with and you, you love seeing. And the exact opposite, the, the thing that gets you uh, angry and up in arms in a second, the stuff that you really think is wrong with the world and uh, the kind of statements you believe only idiots make. Those two extremes uh, keep you on the platform. And this is exactly and precisely the reason why there is a, a shouting match going on on social media, because people are never confronted with the things in the middle with the grayscale, with stuff that makes them think. They are either confronted with opinions that confirm the existing worldview or the quite the opposite. So that is also the reason why filter bubbles are to blame for things like Brexit, for xenophobia, for Trump and what have you. And that is basically what I try to argue here. Next up, Sebastian. So the idea of filter bubbles and the corresponding problems that you highlight is actually overblown. Uh, I listened carefully, you mentioned this twice, that you paint a picture of search engines and algorithms giving a highly customized, personalized experience. Actually, when it comes to search engines, different people searching something uh, similar receive nearly identical search results to this day. Now, this may change in the future, but we're talking about today. The search query, the query itself, is by far the best uh, determinator to what results to display. It's not based on who you are. The, 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 actually, the significance you talk about is overblown based on the, on the research I have conducted. Interestingly enough, to go in a, in a different direction slightly on a tangent here, another study has shown has how personalized recommendations in the area of music has actually created more common tastes rather than fragmenting tastes. And my analysis here is to say that people tend to converge towards an opinion rather than being stuck in what maybe their initial opinion was. For the better or the worse, by the way, in music, I don't think it's a good thing that everyone tends to converge towards the same taste, but it tends to show that even with personalized recommendations, it tends to convergence of opinions. Uh, you say it's not about user choice, but it is about user choice initially when you choose to follow people or friend people. And this is what you observe on Facebook. 80% of the friends we have on average, are people with the same beliefs that we have. And I don't think you, Dirk, uh, who's an intellectual, and I say this with uh, utmost respect, is representative of the general population. I think most people will go towards people who think the same way as we do. Right? You like to, uh, you like, I mean, look at this podcast. You, know, you enjoy this podcast because it confronts opinions. You force yourself to think in a different way. How many people do this? This is the whole point of this podcast, to encourage people to think from another perspective. But this is not what we do naturally. 
And no matter what Facebook, Facebook's or Twitter's algorithm for its newsfeed or the way the tweets are shown, people are simply more likely to follow people they sh who share similar beliefs. This is confirmation bias. You go towards the thing that you like by default. Just like you mentioned in your initial piece uh, to me, you said people feel confirmed by the number of likes that a piece of article gets. But it's the same thing. You said it yourself, confirmed, right? It is again this bias towards confirmation. Education undoubtedly is the counterbalance to filter bubbles because uh, these bubbles expose people to this common base of knowledge instead of trying to get maybe a, a, a bigger uh, uh, perspective. But this has nothing to do with the concept of filter bubble or the fact that people ha are limited in their narrow-mindedness because they don't have the tools to think in a bigger way. So no, you can't blame filter bubbles. They're nothing new. And we choose our friends and we've always chosen our friends and this is going to continue. So the algorithms actually play a very, very little, very little part in influencing our opinions. Final statements. Dirk, let's hear it. Search engine results, not that different. You say, yeah, maybe sometimes depends on what you search for. I do think that Facebook and Twitter and so on are the bigger problem, indeed. The convergence of opinions that you mentioned, yes, that I would call manipulations. It, we don't care when it's music, but basically, what about political affiliations? The person that throws more money into the engine and can uh, um, bring more ads to the front of users will be more successful around this. And that is a problem, I would say. Before I close off, a couple of phenomena that in the past would have been disregarded as too stupid and niche. Flat Earthers, Pizzagate, QAnon, the alt-right that now shouts we are the people despite the fact that there are less than 10% of the population if it really comes down to it. All of these groups legitimately believe that they have thousands of people agreeing with their beliefs despite the fact that this is not the case. And the reason they believe it is because of filter bubbles. So yes, filter bubbles are dangerous. They are to blame for Trump, Brexit and other phenomena. And uh, they are something new because they are empowered by tech. Thank you very much. Sebastian. Let's not confuse filter bubbles with fake news. We're talking about the bubbles, the bubbles of information. If, those inf if this information is fake, the problem is the fake news. And we had another debate on this. When we talk about blame, let's not confuse the blame of bubbles with advertising and the power of advertising. Let's not confuse the concept of bubbles with the power the internet has. If we want to blame the internet, we could do that. Let's not confuse blaming the notion of bubbles with blaming someone who's really dangerous for that matter, and that's Trump. And we already discussed also this in another in the debate. In which debate does Trump does not come in with? It's quite interesting over the past two years. In the end, we always choose, we have always chosen, and we will continue to do so, to choose the friends we have, to read the articles we want to read. And unfortunately, we are subject to this confirmation bias. So the concept is absolutely nothing new. And I was surprised indeed to realize that the personalization of search results, for instance, actually plays a very minor role today. Now, this may change in the future. This may be worrisome because of this natural trend that we have to confirmation bias. But today, there's no point blaming filter bubbles. This is not where the problem lies. They're nothing new, and the problem is, is elsewhere. And I'm not going to say where is the problem. I've hinted at this, maybe lack of education, the power of advertising, maybe technology, maybe politicians. I don't know, but they're not filter bubbles. That's it. All right. That's it. Uh, I, I, you told me that you you were you didn't like to be on the side of against. Yes. Which arguments did uh, I, would, no, no, would no, you no. have used that I did not use? In that particular in that particular case, I'm actually uh, th that one was good. In the next one that we record, I was not comfortable with the side. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I'm just wondering if you had other arguments. No, I, I would have I would have picked similar arguments that you do, you picked. Um, I personally think um, it's. My, my, my counter argument I think that I would have pulled is it, ha it has never been that easy to break free of filter bubbles. So you're always just one click away from the complete opposite opinion and grayscale and everything. And to your point, I actually agree with the one assertion that uh, people are usually too lazy to do that. 
which is which is kind of the problem. It's easy to burst filter bubbles, but we don't like to do it. I actually had one more thing I, I did not mention. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I had too many things here, and I'm, I'm just too tired. But one more thing I, I, I did have here, maybe not a very strong argument, but but we, we talked about maybe the blame that technology bears in this case. But I, I wanted to say that technology also can have a net positive effect when it comes to information diversity because. It, to your point, which is what you just said, it's not just the local city newspaper guy who gets to write the stories. Right? You have a system now where if people want to find things, it's easier than ever. Right? And if even, even one step further, if you want to publish things, it's easier than ever. It's not just about finding the information, not even just as a consumer, but if you want to express your opinion and have this very minute um, diffusion of knowledge or even opinions, it is possible today. Now, whether you take advantage of it or not, is maybe another question. And that's why I try to shift the debate from the notion of the filter bubble to to other things, like maybe to the overuse of advertising money in political campaigns, or the, right? which is shifting the, the, the opinions of people. Yeah, or the, uh, the trustworthiness of sources, because that's the other thing. Yeah. And I believe it's an element of filter bubbles is that we are wired to take social proof as actual proof. So we are, we are in a world where we there is barely anything we know for certain. Even if we are studying fields, uh, even if we are studying something, there is barely anything we really can tell for sure and think through to the very end. So we have to depend on others we trust and their opinions. And I do believe uh, an, an unfortunate effect of social media is that uh, this mechanism is basically put, in, uh, put at work for engines that optimize for advertisement revenue. So uh, all of a sudden I see retweets or shares of articles coming from people and it feels very much like this is adding social proof. And as soon as enough people share something, it's very hard to convince people about um, the, the fake aspect of it. And to, to the point earlier, yes, we can talk about the difference between fake news and filter bubbles. And yes, Trump is certainly not only an, a child of filter bubbles, but uh, it has been a couple of hundred thousand voters that made Trump reality. And the argument would go that maybe filter bubbles played a role here. Uh, maybe filtering views and maybe overemphasizing and amplifying messages that are uh, resonating with Trump voters was a factor. And that's exactly where I, where I feel a bit threatened by the whole concept. Because if people are not putting in the energy, just follow the herd more yeah. or less, then, then it's easy to, to manipulate, that's easy to steer, and that's dangerous for democracy outcomes we see in elections and all that. You were about to say something, sorry. No, no I'm just thinking, uh, based on what you're saying. I, 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 I wonder because you know who can tell who can tell for certain how people who voted for Brexit or people who voted for Trump were influenced by that and that piece of data they have seen because this is a lot of like post voting yeah, analysis yeah. maybe regardless of all this it would still have been the same result I don't know because people fe were were fed up with the EU with Brussels right for, whether for good or bad reasons it doesn't matter with Trump. He did not win the popular vote, right? You could you could also blame the fact that Republicans, Republicans and Democrats before that, before them, have redesigned where the votes are counted, right, by counties and everything. So, and and the system of the electoral college, right? You could always blame other things. So I think it's very difficult to to point the blame at something which I, I I'm tempted to go your way, right? To be honest, I'm just trying to be devil's advocate here because it's. It, it's it to us it's so baffling that people would have voted for brexit or, or for trump that we're trying to find like rational explanation when actually maybe there's very much of an emotional aspect to it which has nothing to do with maybe the russian ads or the russian influence or the or the concept of filter bubbles it's just that people felt genuinely not represented by hillary clinton right because of this arrogance that she was displaying to the you know to the middle class american yeah, as simply as that or brexit is like well, the UK has never felt very much European. Right? I, they joined the EU very late. Yeah. 
they've always felt like you know independent from the from from uh, the EU and you take away London all of the UK basically apart from Scotland was anti-european right and it has been that way for decades right so and when you look at the results even Trump or brexit it's a close vote right the majority has shifted only by a few percentage points so I was, I was just thinking about all, of the, all this when you were describing the effect how can we tell for sure that was the I don't know maybe maybe there are some studies but it's yeah. difficult to be in people's minds for certain as to what what did things really influence like the guy who voted Trump was it really because he saw like repeated ads and saying a crook you know, crook Hillary? I, maybe, I don't know. I don't know. Yes, maybe you're right. Maybe people are dumb. Maybe we should cut <laughs> this off, but I don't know. Um, I well, have no idea. That, let me draw a parallel that maybe, um, and, and talk about something we do know. So, it, and it's actually very related because I believe it's based on the same algorithm. So let's say instead of opinions and facts and information and fake news and what have you, um, little wrong or f or true factoids if you may instead of that let's let's look at pricing pricing of goods that you buy online so if you go to a web page of your choice that sells flights or vacation trips and you do a search um, it's a very high likelihood that you would be surprised about the price difference that you see whether or not you surf there with your regular browser that has your regular surf history locked into whatever you're being locked in at the moment and a different browser in private mode browsing um, that you just set up for this purpose. All of a sudden prices change because the algorithms realize from what you usually surf to, where you come from, what you clicked on, what you may have purchased in the past, the average price that you are willing to pay without checking twice. So if you're somebody who has a little bit more money in the pocket, then it's more likely that you see higher prices in online portals than, uh, than the other way around. And that's just a logical result of uh, the ability our, our advertising networks produce. Now, so, so what you say here, I, I actually, I, again, I think it's overblown. Uh, I, I have read a bit about the airline ticketing aspect and most airlines have denied uh, practicing any IP or cookie based uh, pricing changes. They've denied it. So whether it's true or not, I don't know. But apparently it's not as acute a problem as you seem to portray again. Maybe some companies do it. I'm not saying nobody does it. Yeah. What I'm saying is that I thought more people were doing it. And it seems when I looked at, looked into it, not, not for this debate, but maybe about a year ago, because I was, indeed I do this very often. I actually open Incognito, I use different browser because I hesitate on my on my stuff and I don't want to have, you know, I don't want to think twice about it. So I'd rather just redo the entire thing without my cookies being stored by the airline. So I don't know, the, the latest information I had read about this is that it's not yet to the point that everyone does this. I know, I, I, so, so that's why I think it's a question of, pro of proportion. If I'm, if I'm right, then I think we're we're not yet to the level of of filtering and customization that you're describing, which, by the way, from a business standpoint, makes complete sense. Absolutely. Like if you put aside any ethical, any political, any democratic eth like consideration, it makes complete sense. Yeah, it might even. I mean, I'd rather like as 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 some advertising companies would say, you know, I'd, you'd rather have if if I have to have an ad, might as well have it customized. Right. Yeah, I mean, you, you could even turn it around and say it's a good thing. I'm not even making an argument for or against it. I'm just saying if we are able to do that for pricing and it may not be as True. big a problem as, uh, as, uh, as you say, but it is an existing, uh, it's, it's an existing effect. So if we do that for pricing, what, what makes us think that we don't do that for articles, news, opinions, what have you? And how do you explain things like the QAnon or the, the, the Pizza Gate or the Flat Earther Society, where you feel like those people are really nuts and uh, you, you think it's, it's satire until you realize, no, they really mean it. And the reason why they yep. strongly believe in what they say is because they find thousands of others that just say it's true. And so if it's like a million flies cannot, uh, cannot err, right? It's a... Uh, it's it's a it's a weird effect, and that's an effect of self-selected um, biases. And to the point that you were making, our reality is what we take in. So you have no other way to form your real reality than through the media you consume. It's literally changing how your brain is wired. 
the kind of stuff that you seek out for for your stimulation, the kind of information you take in changes how you see the world. And the more that's selected for you, the more biased your worldview will be. And it may not be the full effect yet, but uh, hey, um, do we have to wait until it's in full force? Can't we just be a little bit more skeptical now? Agreed. Don't do that. So it always us, confuses me when you agree with me. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't handle that when you agree with me. <laughs> don't, don't worry, we'll have another debate coming up in just two minutes. So you have another opportunity. We have another opportunity to disagree. <laughs> Wonderful. But to our listeners, tell us, tell us <coughs> what you think. Vote uh, for or against the motion uh, on, the deba- on the website, to debate.net. But also, if you have an example of a filter bubble that you pissed, that you broke away from, tell us over email or in any comments, uh, because I'm interested. We're interested to know if there's any way that you've managed to realize that you were living in a filter bubble of any kind, whether it was a political opinion or another opinion that that you were having and something made you think differently. Uh, I'd be curious to hear more about you, about your experience. So don't hesitate. Email us at, uh, what's the email address that they can Mail use? at the? todebate.eu. Mail. And Mail at todebate.eu. I like to think about our podcast as an exercise in bubble bursting, right? So uh, I hope so. It certainly does uh, challenge me every single time. So I, I hope it challenges our listeners too, to sometimes reflect on some of the 50 or more debates that we have already published and maybe change their opinions one way or another. And uh, I think uh, I think in, in almost all the debates except one, uh, which was the medical one, uh, I, I think any, any position is tenable. I think there's enough arguments on each side that it's perfectly comfortable um, to have any, any opinion. So by all means, if you have changed your opinion on something, tell us. Uh, you don't have to tell us what you think, but you can tell us, oh, you know, our debate, our debating podcast has changed your opinion. Oh yeah, that'd be be that'd be nice to hear. That would be great. Yeah. And one more thing, if you happen to have an idea for a debating motion, you either die to debate with us or want uh, to hear us debating over. We have a form for that where you can drop these ideas in um, to debate.eu slash suggest is there to take your suggestions. And try to stay alive until we debate, because uh, Dirk, you mentioned that you know if you if you feel uh, how do you how do you say it if you're dying. <laughs> I know that's the expression, but in general for debating, it's good if you still stay alive. What? what? <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. You can cut this off. All right. I'm confused. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned. We have another debate being published very very soon. So if you can't wait, well, you'll have to wait one more week, and we'll have the next debate in your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening again. Thank you, Dirk. Bye.